dragons, one of the most powerful creatures you can field in battle. But how well do you really know this majestic and mysterious beast? Do you really understand their needs and how to make the most of what they can offer you? We'll have a little look at where, when and why to use them in melee, and also the stats and what makes all their breath attacks different, amongst other things. So, let us begin. So, dragons, a very strong, very powerful, very expensive single entity monster that many factions can bring into battle from the high elves, the wood elves with the forest dragon, the black dragon for the dark elves, the chaos dragon, the zombie dragon, even the terror geist we're going to call a dragon, although I know technically not a dragon, but basically functions the same. Dragons offer you a very mobile flying unit that can get around quickly, that is high mass so can't be held onto, has armor piercing damage so it can seriously do some work, and even has a ranged attack with its breath. But how much of a difference is there really between all these dragons? Well, if we look at the armor of all these dragons, you can see it's pretty much the same and then goes up with the more money you spend. The leadership, 75, 80, 85, goes up with the better dragon, right? Melee attack, as they're a damage dealer, is always higher than melee defense. But the more money you spend, the more melee attack and melee defense you get. And it goes up depending on the quality and price of that dragon. So that's quite normal. The same with the weapon strength as well, you get more as you go, 580 for the big star dragon. Although charge bonus kind of goes the other way for some reason, the sun dragon has 65, the moon dragon has 50, and 45 for the star dragon. So for the most part the stats increase with the more money you spend on a dragon. But this is pretty obvious info, right? You get what you pay for. What I'm trying to say here is that all dragons, whether forest, black, high elf dragon, they're all pretty much the same thing. If you know how to use one, you know how to use them all. There are a few exceptions, like Rakath's dragon is anti-large, Lockheed's dragon is regenerating, but still for the most part, you'll use all dragon type units in the same fashion. The biggest difference is in their breath attack, which we'll look at later on. Let's start with some of the dangers that are presented to dragons, because I see too many people charging their dragons into their doom. So as your dragon moves up towards the enemy army with the rest of your army, you need to have a look at what they've got. Whether campaign or multiplayer, you need to be wary of their missile units, especially armor piercing ones and longer range ones like Jezels here, sniper type units. Same with artillery, sniper type artilleries are a big threat to dragons. If you charge your dragon in head first straight away before the rest of your army really arrives, they're going to get focus fired, shot by all the things in the area and they will quickly be killed. So understand that dragons are not indestructible flying fortresses and missiles are probably the biggest danger to them because they're much harder to escape. So if you do accidentally charge up, you need to get out of there quick time, but really the dragon should probably be still sat back here waiting for the right time to approach. You need to have patience. The other option is that you can fly out really wide away from all the missiles and artillery and start to set up a bit of a flank if you really need to, rather than charging headlong into the enemy army. There's nothing wrong with your dragon being out of combat while the rest of the army is fighting until it's safe for it to come in. What it is, you can go after those missile units yourself. It is obviously very good for that, being very mobile. It can take them out quickly. It can possibly terror route them off. You just need to be careful. If you get shot up, if you sit in front of a missile unit trying to kill another missile unit, you're probably going to take more damage than you'd like. So you've got to make sure the big danger threats of the missile units and artillery is dealt with before you bring the dragon in. Otherwise, it's a bit suicidal. Another threat is, of course, in melee infantry that is anti-large, but these are not so much of a threat because we can actually get away from them very easily by simply running away. Then monstrous infantry or cavalry that is anti-large can also be a problem, like dragon ogres or grail knights, but again, we can run away to some extent. They're a bit faster and harder to get away from, but we should still be able to. And single entity anti-large monsters like the dragon ogre or a carnosaur are also a worry, but again, we can run away. So you can charge your dragon into a good matchup and do some damage, but when one of these units comes along, these anti-large units, it's probably best to get out of there. As we're very high mass, we're hard to hold on to, so the enemy will have a hard time stopping us from getting away, unless they happen to be faster than us. Then it can be a bit of a problem, so you need to be wary of what's coming towards you and get yourself out of there quickly before they can get a hold of you. As I said, things like cavalry and monsters might be able to keep up with you more, so you have to be really wary of them, because if they keep hitting you when you're trying to take off on the ground and you're running away, you're just going to be taking unnecessary damage. So be wary of the units coming your way. And you also need to be wary of air superiority and whether you have it or not. If there's a strong flying lord knocking around, a strong flying hero and a strong flying cavalry or unit of some kind, 
there's a good chance they may try and team up on your lone dragon. And as the dragon is generally the slower of the flying units out there, they'll have trouble getting away by simply running. So they'll either need some support from missile units to deter those flying units from coming after it, or the next best thing you can do if you see yourself about to be double teamed here, try to go to ground, attack an enemy unit on the ground, make the dragon and those units follow them to the ground, and then try and run through one of your units to stop them chasing you. As you can see happening here, using these spearmen, stop the paladin there, Luen's going to get caught on them, and my dragon now has escaped. We've tied up those enemy units and my dragon is going to be fine, for now. So be cautious of getting outnumbered in the sky because dragons unfortunately aren't that quick. But alas, there is one more threat to dragons which is arguably much more dangerous to them than those other threats. Because I think it's a bit of a silent killer. People don't realize what's happening. That danger is prolonged combat, fighting for a long time, primarily against its main targets, infantry and maybe cavalry. So this is something we must avoid most of the time. But why, I hear you cry? Well, it's because dragons have bad melee defense. That's right, I said it. But I know what you're thinking. Zerk, dragons have 40 to 50 melee defense. That's a good number of melee defense, right? Well, for infantry or maybe cavalry, sure, that's true. But for single entity monsters, there's an issue. As you can see happening right here, the animations of dragons get them stuck right into the middle of crowds, of infantry, of cavalry, whatever. They will get surrounded. The problem with this is that our melee defense stat is only fully effective from the front of a unit. So when you're surrounded and taking lots of attacks in the sides and back, your melee defense is significantly reduced. When any model takes an attack from behind, its melee defense number is reduced by 70%, and from the sides, 40%. So if on the unit card it says 40 melee defense, well you've got that when attacks come in from the front. But from behind, you've probably only got about 10 melee defense, and from the sides, about 20 odd melee defense. So only attacks coming in from the front of a dragon will have a decent chance of being avoided. So obviously three quarters of the attacks coming at you are going to have a good chance of landing on you. Because your melee defense as a single entity creature actually kind of sucks. Because you're getting attacked in all of your weak areas a lot of the time getting yourself surrounded. And as you can see this 800 cost unit of Saurus warriors is beating the Scheisser out of this chaos dragon which costs 2700. The prolonged combat is killing it. So this is the biggest reason not to leave your dragon in a prolonged fight with infantry and cavalry and anything that surrounds it. So how are we supposed to be using dragons with all these dangers around? Well there's two important aspects of their game we need to take advantage of. Charge bonus and terror. Long story short, dragons need to be on the move a lot of the time. Charge in, do some damage, get moving. Charge in, do some damage, get moving. Charge in, terror route get moving. Similar to how chariots are supposed to be used, you keep them moving most of the time. Especially as dragons have pretty huge charge bonuses to make use of. Too much prolonged combat makes Jack a dead dragon. So quite simply, we need to scan the battlefield for good vulnerable targets that we can attack, make use of our charge bonus so we get some extra melee attack and weapon strength, do a bit of damage and when something comes along that's going to make that matchup bad for you, or your charge bonus runs out, which is at around 13 seconds for it to completely go away, then it's time to get out of there. So you want to stay in combat for around 10 to 20 seconds, unless a bad matchup comes along where you might get surrounded, then you probably want to get out of there. Fly off and look for a new target. We took about half the HP off a unit of aspiring champions, that's some good work. Now we can move on and look for a new target. Here we see some trolls struggling, the perfect target to make use of our terror. Fly down, hit them and they will be terror routed. Anything below around 30 leadership will likely be terror routed when that dragon arrives. We also got our charge bonus again, so we did a little bit of damage to those trolls and then we're off again and we're going to look for a new target. Also with all this in between time in the air, we have a chance to scan for good breath attack opportunities to make the best use of those. Here though I'm going to see a dragon ogre shagoth that I'm going to try and get rid of. I'm going to use Lord of Dragons to reduce his melee attack so that he doesn't do too much damage to us because of course he is an anti-large monster that we normally don't want to tangle with. But we got some help from the Lothan Sea Guard as well so we spied an opportunity to get this Dragon Ogre off the field nice and quick with the powerful attacks of Imric on Manathnir. So we're going to stay here a little bit longer just to try and get rid of this Dragon Ogre. We've got some attacks in the back there that's good for us. If we can route this off it would be a big win for us and then again our Imric Dragon is going to take to the sky and go and find a new target going to get the route on this dragon here and he's going to run away we're going to let somebody else chase him off and then we're going to go and look for a new target ourselves we spy a bunch of trolls in the distance all grouped up 
this is breath attack prime opportunity. So we're going to use our sky time to find this good breath attack and use it. In it comes. And then we're going to fly in and try to terror out these trolls if they don't route already. One's wavering. We'll bring the dragon in. And they both get terror routed. Again, making use of the terror and our charge bonus as well. Doing some damage to these trolls as they run away. So we're constantly on the move. Constantly looking for new targets that are good matchups for us and staying away from those bad matchups. Any anti-large units, any prolonged combat, it'll be time to move on and get going. Of course though, this is very micro-intensive to keep an eye on your dragon and keep moving them around every 10, 15, 20 seconds. So it is a lot of work, but if you can keep a dragon in good health near the end of a battle in the late game, they can be damn near unstoppable. When the enemy army's all beaten up and very susceptible to being terror routed, by our large mobile terror routing beastie. So just to reiterate all that with a tactical view, we fly in here, do some damage, some stuff starts to come over, so we get the hell out of there, get on the move again, look for a new target. Here we see some trolls, terror routable, we're gonna fly down there and get them. Do a little bit of damage to them as they route away, and then we're gonna get on the move again. As the enemy units start to react to our presence and chase after us, we're gonna get out of there and find a new place where we can go, because we're very mobile, we can get around quickly. Gonna attack the Shagoth here, Going to put lots of damage on that, try to route that off. Prolonged combat with other single entities isn't as bad because we're not taking the reduced melee defense attacks from the sides and back. So we can get away with it a little bit more. But again, we're going to get out of there, use our breath attack here, get these trolls, terror route them off. Again, just using our terror, constantly getting our charge bonus, flying around looking for breath attacks, always moving all over the place all of the time. Like I said, very micro intensive, but if you can do this, your dragon will be damn near unstoppable, provided it can avoid all the other threats. So that is how we can use dragons most effectively. Not letting them get beaten up in melee, getting surrounded, and simply running away from all the dangerous melee threats that may try to take them out. But of course, they probably shouldn't even be in there yet anyway if there's lots of strong missile units still knocking around. So use your dragon like a chariot, and it can do untold amounts of work. So then, on to breath attacks, the fiery death that rains down from above. These are a very powerful tool at your dragon's disposal, but very often I see them wasted mostly by impatience. Taking the time to set up a dragon breath attack properly can sometimes double or maybe triple the damage performance than if you use it badly. Before we take a look at the setup though, let's take a look at some numbers so we can see what the real difference is between the different kinds of breath attack. Here we have most of the dragons in Total War Warhammer 2. Sun, Moon, Star, Black, Forest, Chaos, Zombie, Frost, Terror, Geist. These are all some of their most important stats to think about. First of all, we have area. This is the calibration area. How much ground does the breath attack cover? The bigger the number, the bigger the area. So the Sun Dragon with 35 covers a large area, where the Star Dragon with only 12 covers a smaller area. Then we have distance, which is calibration distance, and range, range being where the ability can be used from, 90 meters away, it's pretty much the same for all dragons as you can see apart from the Terror Geist, and calibration distance is where that range kind of falls off in accuracy after that certain point. So as you can see it doesn't really matter, it's only 10 meters, so breath attacks are overall pretty accurate, with the Terror Geist's breath attack being entirely accurate. So all we can see from this is that all dragon breath attacks are the same in accuracy and range. The only exception is Gordonar from the Imric campaign, who has a longer 120 range. And then we have damage or base damage and armor piercing damage. Now, if we compare the high elf dragons, sun, moon, and star, we can see the difference in their area and their damage. The sun dragon having the biggest area that it covers with its breath attack, the moon having slightly smaller but still pretty big, and then the star dragon having a really small area that it covers. But then if we look at the damage, we can see that the Sun Dragon has mostly base damage at 55 and only 22 armor piercing. The Moon Dragon, kind of similar, but just more numbers, right? 68 and 41, mostly base damage. But the Star Dragon is the other way around. 32 base and 50 armor piercing. So what this all tells us is that breath attacks with more armor piercing are going to be better against armor, as the unit card probably tells you. But also the area is what makes certain breath attacks good against large. The Star Dragon's breath attack is listed as good against large because it has that small area. And all these breath attacks bar the Terror Geists have 15 projectiles in their breath attack. So when you have a big area, that's 15 projectiles spread out over that area. And you can imagine when you have a smaller area, those 15 projectiles are much closer together. So it's much more tightly packed and dense than a bigger breath attack area. 
So this is why the Star Dragon and Moon Dragon as well are listed as good against large targets, because their area and their attack is a little more focused rather than being large and spread out like the Sun Dragon. And then you have the Black, Forest and Zombie Dragons who are all pretty much the same deal. They have the same size area, more base attack than armor piercing, all around similar numbers. Which makes them good at attacking units of infantry or maybe even cavalry if they're tightly packed enough. And then there's the Chaos Dragon which is much like the Star Dragon, it has a smaller area but more armor piercing damage than base damage so it's good against armored units and maybe large units as well. And then you have the Frost Dragon which is going to be the Frost Worm for Norska. This has a smaller area so its attack is a little more tightly packed but it doesn't have great damage, only 40 and 24 on the armor piercing but of course that does come with the Frostbite effect as well which is going to add to the value of it but really it's still one of the weaker breath attacks. And lastly the Terrorgeist you might notice is quite different, it has a very small area with only 10, has the accuracy with the same distance and range and has massive armor piercing damage and a decent amount of base damage but it only has 4 projectiles as opposed to the 15 of the other breath attacks which makes it exceptionally good and pretty much only good against large targets because it's such a small area and there's only four projectiles, you're really only going to do decent damage to something that can feel the effect of all four of those projectiles. So that's why some breath attacks are better at certain jobs than others. Some are better at killing infantry, some are better at killing large. So that's all the numbers of it, let's look at some more practical examples of this. So here we have the three dragons, sun, moon and star. Here they are launching their breath attacks into piles of empire swordsmen and this will show us the shape and size of the breath attacks. If we look at the Sun Dragon first of all, we can notice it's a pretty long and wide shape, kind of rectangular, covering a large area, that 35 calibration area coming into play. The Moon Dragon, very similar, but slightly smaller, right? This only has 25 area, so it's a bit smaller than the Sun Dragons. And the 12 area of the Star Dragon, as you can see, is pretty small. It's a much smaller area that all the damage is going into. So you can understand that if you try to use the Sun Dragon's breath attack, on a Dragon Ogre Shagoth, it's probably going to mostly miss because it's such a large area. The Moon Dragon, a bit smaller though, somewhat good against large, but the Star Dragon is really the best one against large because it has that small area and the higher armor piercing damage as well. So when you look at the unit card and you see it says good against armor, good against large combatants, now you know why. It's got high armor piercing and has a small area, probably best against more single entity monsters. Whereas the Moon Dragon, it says strong against single unit and strong against large combatants, suggesting it can be used against large or maybe infantry. I'd say large like cavalry or monstrous infantry though, rather than single large monsters. And the Sun Dragon only says strong versus single unit because it's not very good against monsters or cavalry. The projectiles are just too spread out to really be effective. You can still do some damage for sure, but not as good as if you're using it on infantry. So if we put this to the test, we'll see the slight differences in the amount of damage that can be done. The Star Dragon only doing a little bit to the Shagoth. This is probably a little bit of a struggle with distance though, you can see the accuracy. The attacks are kind of a little bit all over the place, a lot of the projectiles are missing. And of course the Sun Dragon has a big problem with that in this kind of fight, so it doesn't really do much damage to the Shagoth at all. Let's try it again a little bit closer though, and we should see a bit of improvement. The Star Dragon first of all, doing some decent damage but still missing with quite a few projectiles. So these breath attacks may be actually not that great against large targets like single entities, maybe better against cavalry, maybe monstrous infantry, sun dragon not really doing anything at all, star dragon and moon dragon though putting up a little bit of damage but whether that's worth it for the breath attack is up to you. Because this has been two star dragon breath attacks used on a shagoth and it's barely lost a third of its health. The moon dragon kind of similar, not quite as much damage as the star dragon but still a reasonable amount but again two breath attacks is that worth it. And of course the Sun Dragon, two breath attacks, hasn't really done a lot at all to its Shagoth. But yeah, it can seem a little bit hit or miss when shooting single entity monsters. Sometimes it does do a lot of damage, sometimes not so much. Now though, to the biggest mistake I see players making with their breath attacks, it's this. Not really coming in with the right angle of attack. You can see what's happening with the breath attacks here. As I showed you earlier, the shape of the breath attack, kind of like a long rectangle, right? So when you tie it up with a long thin unit at this angle, you mostly miss. You only hit the center of the unit and the rest just goes behind. You don't really do that much damage. These Chosen haven't been too much hurt, these Chaos Warriors haven't been too much hurt, and even these Marauders from the Star Dragon haven't taken that much damage from this poorly placed breath attack. This is an example of what people do when they rush out their breath attacks. 
Take the time to line it up properly and you can get so much more damage out of that breath attack. Line up the rectangle shape of your breath attack with the rectangle shape of the unit. Attack from this perpendicular angle, side on, to the infantry. And you can see to these chosen, we've done about two or three times more damage than we did attacking them from the front. This is the Sun Dragon Breath though, which isn't great against armor, so Chosen not the best target for it. But you can see the scorched ground underneath the Chosen where the Breath Attack has landed, mostly hitting the unit. Same with the Moon Dragon, a lot more damage done here than was done when attacking from the front. And for the Marauders, same deal, more damage done, although this is the Star Dragon with the smaller zone, so not the best target for them. But you get the idea, line up your breath attacks properly and you can do so much more damage than if you just launch them from anywhere when the unit is not really facing you. Get side on and get the length of the unit with your breath attack. Attacking straight on, that's dumb stuff, that's what the AI does, right? You're facing a unit and then you breath attack it and most of the breath attack goes through it and misses, only the little bit in the middle gets hit. This is not how you want to use a breath attack, you're wasting a lot of it. But wait! There's more to this. Range also can have a pretty big effect, because the closer you are to where your breath attack is going to land, it kind of tightens the spread. So here we have a moon dragon that is pretty much max distance away from where its breath attack is going to land. It's using most of its range here, right? This second one, a little bit closer though, maybe half the distance, it's pretty close. And then this last one is basically right on top of where it's going to do its breath attack. Watch what happens to the shape and spread of the breath attack the closer we are. It gets a lot tighter, being incredibly small when you're flying above something. So this is the normal breath attack used from range, that's what we looked at earlier. This is Moon Dragon breath attack at its biggest. If we get much closer though, you can see it's much shorter now, much more condensed into a smaller space. It's about half the size of the first breath attack. And when we attack from straight above, well, you can see it's a very tiny little circle. So it seems like you can make your breath attack kind of more accurate the closer you are we can essentially change the calibration area. So I thought, well, let's try this out. Two Sun Dragons, two Shagoths, one right up close, one at max distance. Do they do much difference in damage? The answer is yes, it seems like they do. You can really tighten the spread of a breath attack by getting right up above the unit you're trying to attack. I'm not even fully close here. I could get even closer, but he's still done a good bit of damage. Got it down to 5,500 health, whereas the far away one got down to 6,100 health. So quite the difference just by being closer. So if you want to make your attacks more accurate, simply get closer. You can actually change the calibration area, basically. Not just by being closer, but by also changing the angle at which your breath attack is coming in. Interesting. So if you want to attack a smaller area or maybe a small bunched up group of troops, Try and get really close because it'll make that zone a little bit shorter, which can be better. If you've got a character surrounded like here, I did a little test, see if these breath attacks can do any more damage than they normally would. And it is quite effective. It depends on the shape of the target that you're trying to attack. If it's a long spread out unit, then being farther away is probably better. If it's a small bunched up, almost circular bunch of troops, then getting a bit closer can give you that tighter spread, allowing you to hit more of them. And this can be true of cavalry. When cavalry attacks a single target, they all gather around really bunched up. This is the kind of time where you can get up close with your breath attack and just lay it on them. So there is some serious gains to be had by setting up your breath attacks properly and not just rushing them out as soon as you get near something. Look at the distance. Look at what kind of breath attack you have. Is it good against infantry? Is it a tighter spread? Should I get closer to get the most out of it? You get three breath attacks. You can do thousands of value in damage with those if you pick the right targets in the right places and line them up well. Or you can rush them out, mostly miss with the breath attack, and then only get a few hundred damage for three breath attacks. Utter wastage. And then the only thing left to do when thinking about who to target with your breath attack is to do with armor. Is it an armor piercing breath attack? Is it a heavily armored unit? Is it a light unit? You have to decide then where you want to use them. Here's some chosen, some chaos warriors and some chaos marauders all being breath attacked by sun dragons. The same breath attack on three different levels of armor. As you can see, it's had some pretty different effects. The marauder unit has been completely wiped out. So if you want to completely delete one unit from the enemy's army, you can potentially do that. The Chaos Warriors has done a fair bit of damage, but not fantastic because Chaos Warriors are pretty heavily armored. And the Chosen, very little damage because they are very heavily armored. So is it worth it? Was it worth to take that nearly a quarter health off the Chosen? Or was it better to take out the entirety, pretty much, of the Chaos Marauder unit? That's up to you. 
There's no right or wrong answer there, I think. It depends what the threats are that you're facing. But it is something to consider. Those armor-piercing attacks are probably going to be best on those heavily armored units. There are explosions going on in these breath attacks, of course, but that's kind of irrelevant, and all we need to worry about is the base or armor-piercing damage. And here's a mistake that boils my beard when I see it happen. Using a breath attack on a moving unit. A breath attack is launched wherever the unit is at the time. By the time the attack goes off, the unit isn't really there anymore, and the attack mostly misses. Like on these Kepra Guard, it was mostly here, landed in places where the Kepra Guard mostly weren't. But hey, it did half the health off the Kepra Guard, right? That's good, that's half health, that's decent, right? Well, not really. It depends how you look at it. If you were patient and waited for the unit to be stationary, you would get much better results, like so. I think you call this unit deletion. Nearly double damage over what you did on the moving Kepra Guard. Having the patience to set up the breath attack properly at the right angle can vastly improve the damage it does. So don't use breath attacks on moving units. Simply take the time with your breath attacks and you can get so much more out of them. It is certainly more mental work and micro to line up the right angle, get a good distance from your target, whether you need to be closer or farther away, whether your target is heavily armored, whether your attack is armor piercing. There is a lot going on in the heat of battle to think about, of course. But if you can take the time to set a breath attack up properly, you can get far more work out of them than if you use them hastily and kind of wastily. And there's even magical or fire damage to worry about as well. Some breath attacks do fire damage, some do magic damage, so there's that that could come into play as well. But the biggest thing to get right, I would say, if you have to really get anything right about your breath attack, it's the angle. Get that right, line up well, and you can at least land all 15 shots in the projectile. And just to a little word on the Terror Geist, it does function slightly differently, primarily being good at being anti-large, whether it's in melee or with its breath attack. As I said, it has a very small area, it only has four projectiles, but they're very high in armor piercing damage, so you'll want to use them on things like cavalry or monstrous infantry probably, and maybe single large monsters as well. But getting into melee, you're going to go for monsters as well. It doesn't do great against infantry, because its bonus versus large isn't helping it there, and also because it has low leadership, and when a unit gets surrounded, like dragons tend to in infantry, they can also take attacked in the flank or attacked in the rear leadership penalties, which hurts them further again. So they need to be really careful. Most dragons have higher leadership though. The Terrorgeist, however, is pretty low. So best off using it as an anti-large unit, going after monstrous infantry, cavalry, and even single large monsters. This is just a bit different from most other dragons, which are mostly anti-infantry, but they can kind of be anti-everything. They can do good damage to everything, provided they don't stay in prolonged combat too much and get surrounded. The Terror Guys tends to be best off going for the large stuff most of the time. So, just to reiterate the key points, remember, look out for the threats to dragons. Missile units are the biggest one. Run away from everything else, because you're fast enough and mobile enough to do so. Keep them moving, don't leave them in prolonged combat too long. They will take too much damage from all angles with their lesser melee defense from the sides and back. That'll bring them down. The other reason to keep them moving, their charge bonus and the terror. You want to make use of both of those things as often as possible, especially the charge bonus. Move in, do some damage, and then move on so you can get your charge bonus again and keep their damage high. All the while keeping an eye out for good terrorizing opportunities to scare units off, and also good breath attack opportunities. And be sure not to rush your breath attacks so you can make the most of them. So there you go. Some of the more obvious and some of the more hidden aspects of dragons, and how to unlock their true and full potential. They're a mighty damage dealer that can ruin everybody if you use them well. Thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll see you in the future.